day and welcome to Why White Label Delivery, a conversation sponsored by Uber Direct, where we're going to learn from one of the primary leaders in helping restaurants keep their ordering experience native to their brand image while expanding the delivery options offered to your customers. So over this uh, next hour's webinar, we're gonna dive into how white label delivery complements already being on third-party delivery apps, and also hear from a multi-unit restaurant operator who is leveraging third-party and white label delivery to boost their sales. I am joined today by two experts with significant experience on the white label side of things. I am very honored to introduce Bernie Huddleston. He's one of the more tenured Uber employees who has been with the company since 2014 and worked in a variety of merchant supporting roles all over the world for the rideshare and delivery giant. And next up, we have Matt Smith, who is the chief marketing officer of One Table Restaurant Brands, which is based in Los Angeles. One Table is the parent company formed as part of the combination between Tokaya and Tender Greens, which has a combined 46 locations, primarily throughout Southern California and the Bay Area, with a few exceptions. So, Bernie and Matt, it's wonderful to have you both with me here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Tom. Excellent. Well, our goal today is providing best practices and tactics for merchants who are curious about leveraging Uber Direct to accept delivery orders from their own website or app. Um, this is designed for merchants still using Uber's courier fleet to actually deliver those orders. But Direct is a way for restaurants to generate more demand, expand their self-delivery reach, capture valuable customer data, and create a fully branded, much more personalized delivery experience that does not rely on the Uber Eats marketplace for order generation. And native or white label delivery has been a, a very hot topic in this category for years. And it's one that's really shifted over time as the large third party delivery providers have rolled out these abilities for merchants to customize exactly how they work with delivery providers, customize that brand experience for customers and increase deliveries reliability while also reducing the total cost of delivery. So that's a, that's a pretty important list of, uh, of pros right there. So in today's webinar, we're gonna talk about what each of them think restaurants need to know about going direct from a financial, operational, and customer experience perspective. So Bernie, let's, let's begin with you. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what has brought you to the direct side of the business at Uber. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Bernie and I lead the US and Canada direct business. Um, again, that's our our, our white label fulfillment service uh, for businesses that leverage Uber's courier network uh, to offer instant and scheduled same day delivery. Um, and yeah, I've been at Uber for coming up on nine years and I've spent uh, five of those years on the Uber Eats delivery business, which is uh, definitely a lifetime at Uber. Um, and you know, what I really love about the delivery business is the logistical challenge of you know getting the courier to the restaurant right as the food is complete and getting it to the, the customer while it's still hot. It's a very simple problem, but it's, it's very challenging to do well. Um, and when I, when I started on the delivery business, uh, the Uber Eats business, I actually had the opportunity to live in Amsterdam and join the Europe team. Um, and the way that we approached the business was, was very simple. We wanted to ensure that every geo, every zip code, had the best selection of restaurants and that we had the best, fastest delivery time than any competitor and not just on food platforms, but just the best delivery time, better than Amazon uh, reliability. That was always our goal. We built a very uh, strong business in, in Europe. Um, and you know, I, I then came back to the US um, and I've managed uh, our operations team uh, for US and Canada Eats. And that included our courier operations and fulfillment operations. Uh, so I was uh, account all delivery reliability and speed for all, all deliveries for US and Canada. And so now that I've joined the direct team, this is actually the first time that I'm managing a sales and partner management team. Um, but I really like direct uh, because I can fully focus on fulfillment uh, and reliability optimizing the fastest, most reliable delivery experience for, for customers. 
And, uh, you know, we get really great feedback when working with uh, our B2B partners. You know, times with consumers, you're kind of reading the tea leaves, trying to understand consumer behavior. But with a B2B client, they're going to tell you exactly what they want, what what is not, not working, and they're going to tell you face. Uh, and so you can be faster to, uh, to fix those problems. So uh, I've been on the team for about six months and, and I love it. And uh, yeah. Well, that's an incredible background that I'm a little bit of je uh, jealous of some of uh, the places that your job has taken you over the years. Um, but Bernie, I want to begin with you with, you know, the biggest question here. At a basic level, how does direct work for restaurants and the end users? What are they going to notice as well? Yeah, so um, you know, very simply, direct uh, is a, is you know provides local delivery um, for merchants. The customer, in most cases, has no idea that it's an Uber Eats uh, courier delivering their food. They've ordered through uh, the restaurant's app or the restaurant's website, um, and you know they get it delivered. Um, and and basically, you know, they don't they don't necessarily know that it's a Uber Eats courier. So. We are just focused on the end-to-end -end delivery. Um, the merchant or the restaurant uh, group has complete control of their costs. Um, the merchant only pays for what they use. You don't have to go out and build a, a fleet of couriers um, that have downtime. Uh, you're basically, you know, if you have a week that is a bit slow, that's okay. You just, uh, you basically just use uh, fulfillment as needed. Um, so. The customer will also have, we will do integration either through a POS platform or directly with a partner um, that gives the customer this, a very similar delivery experience in terms of update and tracking of the courier um, that you see on the Uber Eats app. But again, it is is skinned and it and it looks, has the look of, of the merchant that we're working with. Hmm. That touches on so many themes that I hear of talking to restaurant operators of all shapes and sizes. So um, that seems like a, a pretty smart response to what the market's been asking um, asking for from you guys. Um, but I want to ask a question, Bernie, um, from my perspective. If delivery providers make the bulk of their money through generating demand and the actual fulfillment of deliveries, isn't there some element of white label offerings that is you know against the company's core interests? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and obviously, it's it's always it's, there's always been a little bit of a, a debate uh, internally that you know I think I think there's a there's a huge amount of value to owning the customer relationship through digital channels, um, and I think merchants and uh, you know especially restaurants are seeing the value of that more and more and more, and typically. A restaurant will have their e-commerce strategy is basically limited to aggregators, right? So they're on Open Table or they're on Uber Eats or they're on DoorDash, right? It's a place where restaurants are aggregated for consumers. And that makes sense for food because a lot of times, like, I don't know where I want to eat tonight. I'm going to go on Open Table. I'm going to discover something. I'm going to make a reservation. I'm going to go where I want delivery, but I'm not really sure what I'm hungry for. And so I'm going to, I'm going to go on the app and it's going to help me make a decision. But more and more consumers want, there are times where I know exactly what I want and I know where I want to go. I'm a regular and I just want to cut out the middleman. I want to go direct uh, to that particular restaurant. Um, you, know, you know, reservation is a great example. If I'm a regular, I don't want to go on open table every time I want to make a reservation. I want to call, the host knows me. If, if, if there's a wait or whatever, maybe there's something they can do for me. That's an example of, you know, I'm a customer. I want to have a direct relationship. And I think for the broader industry, you know, for industries, e-commerce has been an absolute explosion. And for the restaurant industry, more and more restaurants are seeing the, the need to have their own customer relationships with online customers and not simply uh, rely on aggregators. And like, I believe in our product. I believe that there are always going to be customers at any given moment that are not going to know what they want. And Uber Eats does a great job of, of, helping them decide. Um, it also does a great job for merchants to grow their business, to grow their base, to be discovered, to market. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are customers that want both. Um, and merchants, it's very important for merchants to have their own social media strategy, their own e-commerce strategy, and to own relationships for a subset of their, of their merchants. 
And so therefore, yeah, it may, you can say that, hey, it's great that Uber gets to own all of these relationships um, with customers. And we obviously spent a lot of money acquiring customers, probably saw our recent Super Bowl ad. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's not, it's not ours to decide. Customers are going to decide how they want to interact with merchants and merchants are our partners and their growth is critical to our success. And so we need to support them in growing in different ways, even if it isn't directly aligned with our, with our core business. Um, hmm. So yeah, I think that as they're successful, we'll be successful, even if it's not directly on our app. Well, I'm so glad you dove into that. Thank you, Bernie. Um, and Matt, I want to bring you into the mix. So you've been patiently waiting. And, you know, you also have a fairly interesting uh, background and path to what brought you to One Table Restaurant Brands. If you could, you know, tell us how your role as CEO or excuse me, CMO is intertwined with the details of your company's delivery strategy. Yeah, I, I appreciate the promotion. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I joined just by way of background. I joined Tokaya in uh, 2019. Uh, was a partner at a creative agency in New York City that focused on uh, multi-unit restaurants and hospitality called Simmer Group. Tokaya was a client, fell in love, ended up moving out to LA. And uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, we combined with Tender Greens in uh, 2021. So. Uh, you know, in my role as chief marketing officer, you know, I'm in part responsible for generating revenue and, and making sure that uh, we're acquiring new customers. Uh, you know, obviously, delivery channels, all digital channels uh, are a big part of that. Um, and so, you know, we've we've been fortunate to have uh, historically a great relationship with, with Postmates at Uber uh, that now spans not only kind of marketplace, but also uh, Uber Direct and, and white label delivery. Hmm. Well, for those who might not be familiar with One Table, if you could tell us, you know, what percentage of orders is coming in via the marketplace compared to those originating on your own apps and websites? And, you know, I guess you could throw Dine in, in there as well. Yeah, so it, it's obviously evolved. I mean, I think COVID was the great accelerator. Um, you know, I, I don't think anyone uh, would want to do COVID over again if they had the choice, but I think it did drive a lot of digital adoption and, and was beneficial for certain elements of our business. Um, so right now we're about 50% dine-in uh, and of that 50% that's off premise, uh, let's call it uh, over 30% is, is third party delivery uh, via the marketplace. Uh, we are exclusive marketplace partners with Uber Eats and Postmates. Um, and then anywhere from 15 to 20% uh, on average is through our direct digital channels, orders through our website or our app. Hmm. Well, I think there are plenty of uh, competing restaurants out there that would like their numbers to look like like yours do. And, you know, as we've already heard, there are, there are numerous reasons for adding white label delivery, whether it's collecting that very critical customer data, um, obviously very important to somebody in a CMO role, um, but also that ability to customize the off-premises program. And then also, of course, the cost differential there. You know, of those factors, Matt, what do you see as the most important ones at your company? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think I could pick one as the most important. I think, um, you know, uh, as was highlighted earlier, uh, you know, meeting the customers where they are. We call them guests. So meeting the guests where they are uh, is really important. And, you know, I, I do think there is a big kind of browsing factor with third party marketplaces, right? Not knowing exactly what you want to eat being able to go in and shop deals, uh, discover new restaurants, explore new types of cuisines, et cetera. But then we have the subset of, of guests that uh, have really a strong affinity with the brand. Um, and those are the ones that are more likely to come directly to our website. Uh, and we love to be able to just control that experience uh, end to end on the digital side. Obviously Uber is fulfilling the delivery, uh, but completely customize how we structure our menu, how we uh, arrange menu items, you know, to the point that was made earlier. Uh, our industry is a little bit behind the times. Um, we like to focus on operating restaurants and we're a little bit slower to adopt uh, things like e-commerce strategy, which is so critical. Um, but it's important that for those guests that do want to come to our website and have uh, a direct experience with us, uh, that we're giving them what they want and building in certain features that uh, might be important to them. So for example, on the Tokaya side, which is uh, Tokaya is a modern Mexican restaurant uh, that is vegan first and, and every item can be made vegan, but we have a lot of non-vegan items. 
um, we're starting to uh, develop a, a nutrition calculator and, and allergen filter that would allow people who are ordering from our website filter our entire menu based on their preferences in terms of calorie intake, uh, dietary restriction, et cetera. As of today, that's not something that you can do on the Uber marketplace. That's something that's unique to our guests and we can give them that experience uh, if they want it uh, while simultaneously um, making sure that the food gets to them in one piece. You know, just as I said, we're a bit behind the times as an industry uh, in terms of technology. We don't, we don't want to manage and, and create, you know, logistics uh, uh, departments within our organizations. We, our business is uh, difficult enough. We need to focus on making delicious food and, and uh, guest experience. Hmm. Well, from both of you, I think it makes all the sense in the world to look at customers who have, you know, different intents in mind when they open up the app or they, you know, sit down on their phone to make a decision about dinner. I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, those that are kind of uh, open to stumbling into your front door as opposed to knowing exactly where they're going. Um, you know, as you guys have built out your direct, um, your direct side of the business, are there any operational changes needed for some of your, you know, delivery orders coming in through your own channels or is that entirely seamless for your yeah. employees? Yeah. It, I mean, it's extremely seamless. Um, and, and that's why it works so well. Um, you know, it's the same, it, it basically functions exactly like, um, you know, a pickup order, right. Which we've been doing forever. Um, so, you know, if someone places an order through a web, our website or our app, um, the process is extremely similar. We have a kind of to-go and delivery station at every restaurant where uh, the to-go bags are kind of segmented by to-go versus delivery. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just been very, very easy and straightforward. Hmm. Well, that's, uh, that's very good to hear. Um, as a question for both of you gentlemen, what type of restaurants do you see being best positioned to create a direct delivery channel? I mean, obviously so many restaurants have yet to do this. And you know, on top of that, what benefits can this provide, whether you're a very small restaurant operator or a large multi-unit operation like you guys are? You know, I'd like to have you both weigh in on that. Bernie, if you wanna begin. Yeah, sure. Like, I think, um, um, you know, I, I think Matt will probably have a, a, a better answer to this, but I think, I think there's value for all merchants uh, and restaurants to explore uh, a digital space. You know, restaurant is a hyper local business. And so there are, um, you know, there's, you can build a brand affinity in your community and if you have that, there's no reason why you can't also have a digital, uh, digital presence and, a, and an e-commerce strategy. And there are, you know, obviously, if you have a lot of locations, you have scale that that allows you to invest in technology. Some of the things that Matt talked about in terms of the filtering, but for smaller businesses, there are a lot of companies out there that are serving SMBs that can help build an app, help build a website make it very easy for single location or, or a few location mm -hmm. brands to, to get this off the ground. And then, and, you know, we're, we're there to support, like we're there to support uh, a thousand locations uh, across the country or, you know, uh, one location in your neighborhood. Obviously, you know, we support um, all restaurants across our, our marketplace and our delivery services will do that as well. So um, I, I think it's something that, that, that every restaurant should be thinking about. Um, and I think it's sometimes it's like, well, we don't need an app, you know, we're, or, or we don't need a website, you know, we're, we're, we're local. We don't need, we don't need that strategy. We only have a couple of locations. Um, but I think it's, I think it's important for everyone to, to explore that. Hmm. Well, Matt, how do you see that? You know, if you were giving advice to somebody who was curious about all of this? Yeah, I don't disagree. I think uh, the brands that are going to be most successful are those that have you know, strong brands uh, where people feel a connection and, and uh, want to go direct. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's it's an important part of the fold. I think it's it's important to note that um, there's plenty of, of room in the sandbox, right? We, we need our third party marketplace and we really need and, and enjoy our Uber direct relationship as well. Um, on the third party marketplace, uh, you know, we're able to acquire new customers and we've seen a lot of overlap between third-party marketplace, Uber Direct, Dine-In, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I think I think brands, all brands to the point that was made 
um, you know, all brands should try to uh, get as much data on their customer as they can. Um, and, you know, obviously, depending on marketing capabilities, how they use that uh, might differ. But um, it's a great opportunity for us to, um, you know, take the folks that do want to, to order directly from us and have specific needs um, and, and service them, you know, just as they would be serviced if they went through a third party marketplace. Hmm. Well, thank you both for that. Um, Bernie, I want to turn to you because um, in uh, our recent phone call, you shared a notable data point that I've never heard anywhere else in the industry, that online shoppers tend to spend more when independent retailers offer local delivery and pickup. I mean, essentially, that direct customers tend to spend more. Um, that, that's really, I think, a very important data point. Um, but why do you think that is? And, you know, how do you see restaurants boosting their sales by adding a direct channel to their delivery program? Well, I think, um, yeah, that was it was sort of some interesting data that we were looking at on retail e-commerce over the last several decades. And what we were seeing is that as e-commerce is growing, delivery speed is improving. And you could argue like chicken or the egg, right? Like, uh, you know, has delivery speed improved that and has that driven e-commerce growth or like did e-commerce growth uh, demand that delivery speed improves? Um, and I think on on food, you know, we've been doing instant delivery uh, for, uh, you know, for as long as, uh, you know, uh, restaurants have, have existed, you know, no one's going to no one was like, oh, I want a sandwich tomorrow. Can you prepare it and then like ship it over? That doesn't make sense, right? So, so we're actually ahead of the curve in terms of, you know, other industries in terms of, of being prepared and and having the logistics set up to do very fast delivery. And I think a lot of other industries, um, we're especially seeing on retail, um, you know, grocery is, is, is really exploding. Grocery delivery is exploding right now. Um, where, you know, one day, two day delivery is actually not fast enough. You know, I want to order a bunch mm -hmm. of things. I want to try them on and I want to like bring them that afternoon and I want to get everything done in the same day. Um, and I think as, as this delivery speed improves and we start getting to say day for other industries, those, and those other industries will continue to drive their e-commerce growth. Um, because again, mm -hmm. the biggest barrier is, is that delivery speed and that and waiting for your your item to arrive. When it comes to food, I think that's the other piece is that in order to have, have you know, online customer probably wants delivery. And that's true for the industry, right? You have to have a delivery strategy. And I think that's where direct comes in is like, we'll take care of the instant delivery. We have a very scaled uh, logistics model that is very efficient. So you can leverage that. And that'll allow you to have to worry about your logistics and managing that so that you can really focus on driving an e-commerce strategy and, and fundamentally drive growth for your business. Um, and so, yeah, and I think, I think in that sense, a lot of other industries are catching up to the restaurant industry delivery side. And on the e-commerce side, as Matt talked about, the restaurant business needs to catch up with some of the other industries. Hmm. Well, that's uh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, you know, it makes sense as the infrastructure becomes more widespread and more fine tuned and more of a finely oiled machine that, you know, customers would respond to that. But, um, Matt, I'm curious if you guys are seeing that at one table, you know, are your direct or native customers spending more? You know, are those basket sizes higher than those that are coming in from marketplaces? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a bit easier to merchandise digitally. Right. So that's a big factor. Um, you know, when you're when you're dining in, you're limited to your menu boards. Uh, in our case, they're digital menu boards that helps that allows us to get a little bit more bespoke and creative and strategic with how we arrange menu items. In some cases, uh, we do it differently by day part. Uh, but when you have an e-commerce experience, you know, it's all customizable. You have a blank canvas. And so, uh, you know, things like you're, you're getting ready to check out and, you know, you get a pop up that says, you sure you don't want a, a drink or a dessert? Little add-ons, um, you know, and it's a little different when you're just kind of clicking a couple of buttons and then checking out with a paid credit card than watching, you know, this total go up at the POS terminal in front of you. So I think there's a couple, you know, phenomena of online shopping that have translated to 
um, you know, digital ordering for restaurants. And yeah, we're, we're seeing the benefit of that for sure. Hmm. Well, I think it's also natural that the most loyal customers of any restaurant brand have a broader familiarity with the menu. So, you know, things like, oh, do you want to add this to that or do you want to that, add that to that? Well, if you're familiar with that menu item, you know, I think that that um, would naturally boost basket size as well. Um, but, you know, I want to I want to move ahead and ask you both about you know, how, do, how is direct delivery priced compared to a more traditional relationship between restaurants and their delivery partners? And of course, that would certainly be the most important factor for some folks. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I, structurally, you know, on the marketplace, we are pricing based on a percentage of the basket. On direct, mm -hmm. We're not doing that. As a matter of fact, often we don't know value or exactly what we're transporting because what we're getting from the merchant is here. This is the pickup. This is when, and this is where you're going. Um, but we're not actually accepting the order the same way we do um, on the marketplace app on the Uber Eats app. And so, as a result, um, we will we charge based on just the delivery. And so that can be a, a flat fee by mile. Um, that's typically what we do. And there's a current structures that we do. It might be like, it's, you know, a couple dollars plus 75 cents a mile. Um, it might just be a completely flat, flat fee, especially for brands that are like, Hey, we know what our average distance is. Um, and we just want to do a flat fee and keep it simple. Um, so we have a way, a lot of ways to customize and structure that pricing, but it is fundamentally a delivery fee pricing as opposed to a percentage of basket fee pricing. And so you know, mm -hmm. the unit economics, not only are you controlling the, the customer relationship, but the unit economics on those orders should also be ben more beneficial for, for the merchant and the restaurant than on the marketplace. Because the marketplace, you're also paying for marketing yeah. and the discovery. You're not doing that on direct. You're just focused on the delivery pricing. I really like how much sense that makes. I mean, you know, uh, that, that's just a very natural way of looking at the business through the eyes of a restaurant operator. Um, so, Matt, how do you guys feel about that pricing differential? I mean, is that something that is, uh, you know, a big impact to your bottom line? Or is it just, you know, kind of uh, the beauty is in the simplicity of it? Uh, yeah, it's definitely impactful to our bottom line. I mean, it, it's also, you know, it's value additive to our guests, um, you know, I think to the point that was made, um, you know, because typically third party marketplaces charge some sort of commission, restaurants often will increase their prices on those marketplaces to offset some of that, um, you know, given that it's a bit more fixed and, and you know, kind of set on the direct side, uh, I would say most often and definitely in our case, you know, our direct channel ordering prices reflect our in-store prices, even though we're using packaging and things like that, you know, they're the same. And, um, you know, I think some consumers are getting savvy and and they're, they're, they know that things are a little bit marked up on third party sometimes. And um, that often drives them to uh, the direct website of wherever they want to order from. Uh, all that to say, you know, just to reiterate, we still see a ton of value in the third party marketplace. Now, you know, aside from owning the customer data, uh, what better way to market than to get your food into someone's hands, right? If you're not confident that that sells them, then you're not confident in your product. So, you know, we love that element of it. And, you know, we think between uh, them potentially coming for dine-in and us having, um, you know, high density of restaurants in the geographic location, they'll see us around kind of thing. Um, like I said, I think there's plenty of room in the sandbox for all those channels. Hmm. Well, I want to switch gears and um, zero in on the customization factor of going direct. Um, you know, the Uber marketplace is beautiful. It works very well. It's very easy to, to browse and discover new things. Um, and, you know, that's something you guys are always improving. But, you know, on that customization factor, you know, Bernie, what does that look like in a best in class situation? I mean, how different is it? And what about that could be better for the end user? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. I, I, this is something that we've been thinking about more and more recently. Um, and I think probably the best way to describe it is, you know, on direct, 
you know, we have built a delivery network designed for food delivery. But on the direct side and also across our app, we are with new verticals, retail, grocery, um, convenience, prescription deliveries. And so there's a couple of reasons why we do that. One is that these businesses also want instant and faster delivery. Um, and so there's an opportunity there. There's also, there's a big part of our business, a big, uh, you know, cons a cus another customer for us is the courier, is the earner on mm -hmm. the platform. And so we always, Uber always want the most attractive place for earners to come and make money um, and have flexible schedules and work when they want and make the most money uh, that they can. And so we have a big advantage of the rides business and we also have the delivery business. So if you sign up for, for uh, Uber, depending on what type of vehicle you, you uh, drive and your age, you might be eligible for both uh, rides and delivery and you can switch off uh, depending on the day or the time of day. Um, but we're always trying to make that more attractive and be, Uber doesn't dictate Tate, hey, we need you to work at this time. That's a big point for earners working with Uber or even DoorDash or and Instacart, et cetera, is that it's essentially flexible that you can decide when you're going to want to work. But the reality is, is that on restaurants, you know, and food delivery, the market kind of dictates where the opportunities are. And those are lunch and dinner. That's when the volume is really, really spiking. And so you know, if I'm a courier and I want to work only between lunch and dinner or after dinner, there's just less opportunities. And I might be able to make great money during that time, but there's just less volume at that time. So working with other industries, it allows to smooth out those, those curves throughout the day. And we can put non-perishable deliveries in the middle of the day uh, or at the end of the day, or we can do scheduled grocery deliveries in the middle of the day. And that gives earners more opportunities and more earning power um, on their terms. So uh, that's also like a big advantage for, for us. And so when it comes back to customization, working with all of these different types of parts has you know, required us to build a lot of customization, a lot of new features that, that even though our delivery network is designed food delivery, We've actually been able to pull those in and offer them to our our food um, uh, direct partners. And so, a couple of examples are prescription delivery, right? There's a there's a level of uh, breakage that we ex that we kind of accept on on food delivery, right? Like, hey, we didn't get the the sandwich delivered or it was late, and we have to take care of that. That's not what we want to do. We always want to improve that. But a burger can be replaced. We can we can refund. A prescription often can't be replaced. And there's an actual safety issue to a prescription that is wild in the community or that the patient didn't get. Mm -hmm. And so we built a lot of features and a lot of tooling to really make uh, an improved uh, experience and make sure that every order is accounted for and that if it is not delivered, we get it back to the pharmacy. Um, mm -hmm. And so through those learnings, um, sorry, this is a long-winded answer to your I question. Like long uh, but I think coming back, like one of the things that we've been we've been doing recently is on the marketplace, you know, we we want this to be a fair marketplace and we want rents to basically say, like, hey, if you want to have better positioning in the in the in the feed, you can buy ads. If you want to be more competitive on your pricing, you can you can uh, do offers and, and coupons. Finding. There's a lot of different tools that we offer restaurants to get more visibility and be more attractive within the feed. But the thing that is the same for everybody is the delivery experience. We're not going to a particular partner and saying, hey, we're going to give you prior dispatch because you have great terms and that's what you want. It is basically, it's all the same. And we look geo by geo and we say, hey, you're not doing very good on deliveries at this part of town at this time of the day. And so we're going to optimize for that. But we're optimizing for everybody on the marketplace in that case. Direct is different. We are your delivery vendor. And so one of, again, all that I like about direct and like being on fulfillment, I just have more levers and more things that I can deploy from a product perspective for particular merchants. And so I can basically say, hey, I'm, I'm actually for these stores, it's very important for you to have limited supply of couriers that have more experience
experience that are not branded, brand new to the platform. I can actually shrink my courier for a particular merchant in a particular area. Um, if something that's important for them, depending on what their business goals are, I wouldn't do that on my marketplace, right? I'm, I'm thinking about my marketplace holistically and I'm trying to keep things as fair as possible. So, um, that's just sort of like a philosophical example, like how that actually, uh, translated is that there are brands that like, Hey, we do a lot of late night business and we, we need to make sure that that late night business is more reliable than anything that we do. And, and these are the customers that are going through our channels. And so it is our name. They're not sort of saying, Hey, I didn't get my order. It's sort of Uber's fault. Maybe it's the restaurant's fault. It's like all me. And so I just have the ability. We have the ability to like deploy more, more levers and, and, uh, and, and product features to, um, you know, to, to make sure that we have the most reliable delivery, even if that's a little bit unfair to the marketplace, like we're still small on direct, so we can do these, do these things without affecting the broader marketplace. Um, so one of the things we're talking about with a lot of our partners is, you know, we, we are the most reliable delivery network and we can go beyond that on direct, um, and do more customization, um, for how your deliveries, uh, yeah, will be delivered. So. Something that we're still working on, but uh, something we can do, which we're pretty excited about. Yeah, and it's just really interesting to hear your point of view on that and your company's point of view on that, because, again, I just think that lines up so well with what I hear from restaurant operators. Um, but, Matt, I want to ask you a, a cleaner version of that same question. Um, you know, taking nothing away from the marketplace, what do you like about the user experience for customers who are ordering direct from you guys versus the marketplace? Yeah, I mean, it, the fact that it could be anything we want it to be. Um, you know, if we want to have, you know, massive photos of food, we could do massive photos of food. Uh, you know, you're, you're fitting yourselves into a template or a box when it comes to, uh, you know, being on a marketplace. When it's your website, you can do whatever it is that you want. I mean, that that's the simplest way to put it. You know, referencing the uh, nutrition calculator and allergen filter I mentioned before that's in development or... Um, you know, arranging things in a certain way by day part, again, you know, uh, or by day, you know, people tend to drink more uh, towards the end of the week. They start to get a bit more indulgent in terms of desserts and foods that are not quite as good for them. You know, if we wanted, we could uh, arrange our menu strategically uh, to highlight those items when there's likely to be more demand for them. Um, you know, anything under the sun that, you know, falls in the realm of our creative and technical capabilities, we can do. Hmm. Well, that's that's helpful to hear, and I want to I want to move into the the delivery speed and reliability part of this um, you know direct option. And Bernie, you were touching on some of that already, um, kind of from a, a the courier level and a higher level view of that. But I'm wondering if you can give an example of how this might work for restaurants that either might have some of their own drivers or maybe have you know different staffing. To, depending on the day part, because I think you're, you were both touching on, um, you know, this isn't exactly the same every single day of the week or every time of one day. So, you know, I think that's worth touching on Bernie. Yeah, totally. I think, I think the, um, the, you know, again, like we can, we can customize this and we, and, and you can leverage, uh, direct however works for you. So a good example is, if there's, if we have a restaurant and they're like, Hey, we have our own fleet and we want to rely on that fleet as much as possible. Again, like there are, there are brands that are like, Hey, we want to own it through and through. We want to own the experience through and through. But the reality is, is that there are going to be times where your courier, your, your in-house couriers, your, your employees are not going to be able to fulfill the demand either because their shift is ended, but you want to continue to offer delivery or because you just have an influx of deliveries at any given moment. And so, you know, basically uh, direct can be used as like, hey, we're gonna have our employees cover this area or this radius. And, you know, we're, we're gonna expand our radius um, and we're gonna let uh, Uber Eats manage those deliveries. Or like, we're gonna have our, our team working lunch and dinner, but after the dinner time, uh, you know, those employees are going to stop doing deliveries. They're going to do something else. And we're going to push all of our deliveries to uh, to direct. So this is a very, it's pretty straightforward and, and simple process. Um, it varies depending on what 
uh, how we, how we built the integration. Um, but again, like it's not, you know, we're there to, to support whatever deliveries uh, are needed by the, by the brand. And we have a lot of partners that have their own courier fleet um, or have their own employees doing deliveries and, um, and, and just want to use us as supplemental or like the tough trips that are late at night or, or, or long mm -hmm. distance. Um, and we're, we're more than happy to do that. Hmm. Well, um, part of uh, Uber Direct, which I did not realize, um, is giving merchants the ability to have a fully branded call center for, you know, delivery customers that might be experiencing an issue of some kind. You know, I see that as such a wonderful thing to be able to offer a smaller restaurant group that just simply does not have the resources to do anything like that on their own. Um, you know, I I'm wondering if you can tell us about, you know, how exactly that works and, you know, really how you see that improving the customer customer experience from a brand's perspective. I'd, I'd love to hear what you both think of that. Yeah, sure. So this is, is definitely a, a newer, newer product from Uber, but I think like if you're going to, if you're going to run a e-commerce strategy, there are two things that, and, and own the customer relationship, there are two things that you need to solve for uh, that are difficult if you're not doing it at scale. One is obviously the delivery as we've been talking about, but the second is also support. Um, and so when somebody has, you know, if you start to do a lot of demand, um, you know, online and you're doing a lot of deliveries, customers are, you know, they're missing something, they have a question, they have a complaint, they need help. Um, and you also don't want your store employees to be inundated by incoming support calls and, uh, you know, and also you want to make sure that customers, when they call, reach out, uh, they, that somebody picks up the phone right away and that can help them. And so we do have a product, um, Uber Managed Support, which we, which is effectively uh, we will brand ourselves uh, as our merchant, and we will leverage. Also, Uber has contact centers all over the world in 32 languages, um, uh, several sites in the United States and Canada, um, and so we can leverage uh, these these contact centers that do our larger Uber support um, to support you know, and have dedicated teams uh, supporting uh, support. Sorry, I need to use a lot of redundant <laughs> words here. Uh, you know, actually <laughs> managing inbound uh, support from the customers uh, that are using direct. So, um, and hmm. they'll be able to see like, hey, we see what where the courier is, they're on their way, um, or we see that this was a missed delivery, let's re-dispatch and, and, and get you another order. Um, so we can also manage that as well. And these are usually the two things that you know, as agents go into an e-commerce strategy, especially restaurants, that they're like, I don't want to deal with these two things. So, so we'll take care of that for you. Hmm. Well, I just think that's extremely cool. I mean, that really brings us back to the core of when third-party delivery was becoming a thing. You know, bring the resources of a, you know, huge global company down to a mom and pop. I just, I think that's fantastic. Um, but Matt, you guys are not exactly a mom and pop. You know, is that something that you guys are you taking advantage of the branded call center? Not currently, but um, I do agree that, you know, the support piece is critical. I mean, we, you know, we've been talking a little bit about uh, how hard it is to acquire new guests, right? And so, um, you know, that makes it even more expensive to acquire reacquire that guest or acquire a new guest or get a new guest to the spending habits mm -hmm. of the guest. Very widely publicized how important it is to retain these guests. So the support piece uh, is critical. Uh, you know, for us, we have a, a third party centralized kind of phone system. We manage it internally. Um, and, you know, to the point that was made prior, you know, during COVID, for instance, when we, we had skeleton crews at the restaurants, um, we centralized all communication. We wouldn't even let the restaurants answer the phones because they were so busy, so inundated wow. with online orders that we would centralize it to the point that, you know, for instance, I took Sundays. I managed the whole uh, the whole thing Sundays, including our text program, you know, and it was wild, uh, quite <laughs> easy, you know, very stressful. Um, but yeah, you know, it goes back to a point I made earlier, which is at our core, we want to operate restaurants. That's what we want to do. Um, that's what we're good at, and that's what we need to focus on. And so, uh, you know, resources like delivery logistics and tech and things like that are very important. Um, very few brands uh, outside of massive enterprises 
uh, you know, have the capabilities to develop those competencies in house. So, um, yeah, it's been, uh, I think that's a, I first learning about that uh, support center, I think it's brilliant. Hmm. Well, I want to I stick with you, Matt, because another point that I learned from both of you is that merchants don't have to choose to be on the marketplace or on direct. I mean, you can do both. And I think that's a, an important point to underscore. So I'm wondering, you know, which, um, or, you know, from your perspective, what's the benefit of that hybrid approach, being on the marketplace and offering direct? Yeah. Um, so first, I would say that, you know, your strategy can shape shift based on the lifespan of a brand or of a, a restaurant opening, for instance, right? You know, um, out of the gate when a restaurant opens and you're trying to drive awareness uh, and ultimately trial, uh, it could be a little difficult to get uh, the word out that you're in town, you're open, especially with all the competition and, and potentially limited budgets. Third party marketplaces, you know, give brands exposure. Uh, to more people than uh, they could ever give to themselves when they're at a smaller scale. Um, basically doing for us what we can't do for ourselves oftentimes. But then once we're more established um, and we start creating connections with our consumers uh, to the points that were made earlier, they're more inclined to uh, maybe want a bespoke experience native to our brand, which would drive them to our website. And, um, you know, the ability to do that directly with a, a brand like Uber, you know, I, I know it was mentioned that um, the consumer doesn't necessarily know that it's Uber delivering it. Um, I don't have a problem with the consumer knowing that it's Uber. I kind of want them to know it's Uber because, um, you know, it's like you're, you're ordering a package from overseas. You'd rather have FedEx, you know that FedEx is making that delivery than some, you know, ma and pa logistics <laughs> that might break it on the way and, and maybe it doesn't arrive. So it, it gives us credibility knowing that we're, we're restaurant operators. We're not delivery uh, folks. And, um, you know, I think that's a really positive because something that we really, really emphasize with our team members is the fact of the matter is for most foods, maybe sushi is an exception and a couple others, but, you know, for Mexican food, definitely. When a guest is ordering online, whether it's through the marketplace or through our direct channel, our food, which is a 10 out of 10 in our restaurant, automatically, if everything goes perfect, is about a 7 right? Because it's not hot. The person probably ordered it when they were hungry. So they're getting it 30 to 45 minutes after they were hungry. There's a potential for uh, mistakes, missed items, etc. They're eating it out of packaging instead of a serving in the bowl. Or we're playing our music and giving them our service, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So the margin for error is very slim. And if we can ensure that just the delivery part of that is locked down um, and, and well executed, it, it improves guest experience. Hmm. Well, with the tail end of the time that we do have, Bernie, is there anything that you would add to that of, you know, why a restaurant might want to do both? I mean, of course, some of that's obvious, the discovery factor on the marketplace. But is there anything else that you think is notable? Yeah, I think I think it's I think it's definitely important to do both. I think, um, you know, and I think you're, you're also your your cohorts and your guests are going to, it's going to change over time as well. And you might you know, you might say like, "Hey, I'm gonna. I have marketing dollars. I'm gonna point them towards uh, my channels. I'm gonna. I'm going to point those dollars towards uh, give offers and and reach out to the customers that I've, you know, that I've uh, established through online channels that have come through my channels. Those are my most loyal customers. But you know, you might start to see, hey, open rates are are starting to drop. The the cohort's a bit stale, and you need to grow, actually grow that base. And so then you can go back to the marketplace." Point some dollars there, grow the base, um, and so that's always going to be sort of a changing cycle. Um, so I think again, it's you know has many channels available uh, to you as a as a merchant, as a restaurant owner, um, is really important, and that gives you a lot more flexibility and make and ensures that marketing dollars or when you want to send out communications that you're getting the, the biggest bang for your buck. So having both that. You know, at any given moment, one could be valuable to the other, and that could change, uh, you know, in a week or in a month or in the next quarter. Hmm. Well, I, I, that is fantastic. I appreciate you mentioning all of that. And, you know, I just think of when I'm talking to restaurant operators and their, about their delivery programs, the factors that they get really heated about are cost, 
customer data, control of that guest experience. And, you know, all of that is included in this. So I think that makes uh, a, a lot of sense. Um, but, you know, you guys have been great. That is all the time we have today. But I really want to thank Uber Direct for sponsoring this important conversation. Um, and to you, Bernie Huddleston in particular, and Matt Smith for sharing your expertise and your perspectives about what is clearly one of the most important parts of the delivery equation at this point in time. And to all of you at home or work or wherever you may be who are listening in, I just want to thank you all for joining us. This webinar will be available soon on our website, which is foodondemand.com. In case you want to rewatch, catch anything you might have missed, or share this conversation with anyone else in your organization or beyond. And for those of you who want to learn more about Uber Direct, you can scan the embedded QR code on your screen, um, as well as contact the Uber email address. Um, or you can reach out to me directly, T Kaiser at foodondemand.com. My name is Tom Kaiser, and I'm the editor of Food On Demand. Thank you all for joining us.